Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. We are back with another Learn From Home live session. My name is Rose and I am the marketing and PR coordinator here at Ocean Sonics. And I'm joined today by Emma Carline. You may recognize Emma from some of our previous sessions where Emma has taught us about FFTs, SEL, and SPL measurements. Today, she'll be focusing on her work using hydrophones integrated with PUVs to help locate underwater pingers. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Rose. Thanks for having me. We're always happy when you come on to teach us something new. So for those of you who have joined us for our previous sessions, you'll know that we regularly hold staff learning sessions at our office. And this is where our teammates share their expertise with the rest of our crew. And since our first learn, learn from home live session in the spring, we've had a great response with so many people turning in to learn something new about our oceans and the innovative technology and research being done across the country and around the world. Ocean Sonics has made our live learning sessions a permanent fixture and will continue to host these sessions regularly through our social media channels. These live learning opportunities feature different experts from various fields of ocean research and industry, and all with a focus on ocean acoustics. So keep your eye on our social media channels, and this is where we will share all the details, such as upcoming topics and sessions. If you missed any of our previous sessions, you can find them all online, and we record all of them. They live on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page, so you can visit or revisit anytime you'd like. Today's session will also be recorded and shared online, so don't worry if you missed something or you'd like to watch it again. So for anyone joining us that's unfamiliar with Ocean Sonics, we're an ocean acoustics company and we're based in Churro, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. We created the IC Listen, and this is a real-time smart hydrophone. It's a tool that's used to collect ocean sound data, and what makes it special is that this hydrophone processes data at the source in real time, so you can actively listen and view data while the sensor is deployed. Emma joined Ocean Sonics in September of 2018 as the acoustic algorithm developer. She's been working on novel applications for underwater acoustics, focusing on creating tools for users that allow them to gain the most insights from their data. Emma has been developing a process through which we locate underwater pingers. Pingers are used to help locate and recover items that are lost at sea, such as oceanographic equipment and flight data recorders. So after Emma finishes their presentation, we are going to have a Q&A session. So if you want to know some more detail about what we cover today, you can leave us a comment on any of our live stream feeds and we'll answer it after the presentation. So now Emma is going to share her screen and uh, we'll get right into the presentation and start learning. Okay, so here we go. So today we're going to talk about a place where AVs meet acoustics, and this happens um, in locating an underwater panger. So we're going to talk about uh, a method for doing this that is kind of new. Um, and so we're not an AV company per se, we're not experts in AVs, but we are a hydrophone company and, and we see that there's a very big opportunity um, for for hydrophones to be used in cooperation with AUVs um, to, to get really good um, insets, insights um, underwater. So locating objects underwater um, anytime is challenging. It's very different from air because there's no GPS. And also as you go below the surface, the visibility gets bad quite quickly. So searches, um, visual searches are difficult. Um, and also sound travels fast underwater, which is an advantage, but the speed varies um, greatly with temperature and depth. And this is important because it means that sound doesn't always travel in a straight line underwater. And so this um, causes a lot of inaccuracies in navigation and localization. But many situations do call for a search underwater for an acoustic beacon, or I'll also call it a pinger. And so generally this happens when you're trying to locate underwater assets. They might have been lost or their positions might have shifted over time and you no longer know exactly where they are. Um, in a more specific example, um, we have flight data recorders. And so when a plane crashes over water, 
the black box um, data is, is really important to recover um, because it has clues as to why the crash occurred. And so black boxes are equipped with a pinger that goes off um, when there's impact with water. And um, it's used to help find the black box. And this was actually the original uh, motivation um, for this, this system that we're working on um, because we, we've gotten lots of calls actually after plane crashes um, from people around the world asking if our hydrophones have picked up any of the pings from the black box um, beacon. And yeah, finally, an unforeseen application originally um, is underwater, or sorry, under ice operations. And in, in this situation, we have an AUV that has to try to find a relatively small hole where it was deployed or where it needs to be recovered. And so in many of these situations, it's, it's very advantageous to have the search happen autonomously. So without um, very much control by humans. Um, so one instance is when the search area is large. So it's very difficult to scale up searches um, to large areas when it requires like surface vessels. Um, but it's not as hard to scale um, searches involving AUVs. Um, and also when the environment is hostile, this can be both underwater and on the surface. Um, the average ocean depth is 3.8 kilometers, which is huge and um, yeah, extremely deep. At the same time on the surface, conditions might be rough and unpredictable um, due to weather. Um, another advantage of an autonomous search is that in situations that are stressful, it's known that human operators are more susceptible to making mistakes. Um, so especially when there's a time pressure, um, like if it's known that the pinger battery is not going to last very long, it's easy to make mistakes. Oops. And, but this in turn is, can really slow down a search. So um, autonomous solutions are definitely desirable. Um, so currently we have, we have pinger locating systems. Um, they're usually towed or they consist of fixed receivers uh, or modems. Um, generally not autonomous or not fully autonomous. And many cannot actually locate from a distance. The systems have to travel quite close to the pinger in order to um, determine its position. Uh, so one very specific example is um, in finding black boxes. There is a toad pinger locator or black box finder that was developed by the US Navy. And it has to travel over the entire search area to be effective. Um, this is because it has just one hydrophone. So the information you get from it is, was there a ping in this location or not? And there actually is an operator um, on the surface vessel who who monitors the acoustic data from the hydrophone and manually detects pings. And so they record locations where a ping was heard. And so afterwards, once the system has been towed over the search area, they can estimate where the pinger was located. Um, so a, a good solution to this problem of finding pingers underwater um, we see a big advantage to using an AUV because this allows the search to be kept underwater. Uh, this is especially important when the, the pinger that was lost is deep. Um, it should be mountable on an AUV. Um, this allows AV to be autonomous to search anywhere. And also it should be able to locate the pinger from a distance. It should, because we can hear pings from a distance we should be able to find it without actually getting up close. And a huge advantage to using AVs is that they're mobile. And so they can actually adapt their path um, based on what they're hearing. Um, so the method that uh, we're working on, um, how it works is, 
Well, first we assume that the depth between the AUV and the sound source is small, so they're quite similar. They basically lie in a plane, so it's a 2D problem. And how it works is we're going to use the, the time difference of arrival of the ping between the two hydrophones on the AUV. Um, because the hydrophones are, are not in exactly the same place, the ping will arrive at different times. And this actually can be used to calculate a bearing to the sound source, so the pinger. Um, in reality, um, the time difference corresponds to a hyperbola of possible positions where the pinger is located. But this becomes a bearing if you're far enough away, because hyperbola, hyperbola looks like a pair of lines. Um, with two hydrophones, you have two lines, two possible bearings. Um, and one of them is the correct bearing, and the other is bearing with the same angle, but on the opposite side of the, of the AUV. And so we need to figure out which one is the correct one. And this can be done in actually a couple of ways. You could add a third hydrophone, and that will allow you to determine which bearing was correct. Um, it would eliminate one side of the AUV. And the other option, though, is just for the AUV to make a turn so that it receives, um, receives the next ping in a slightly um, different position. So the AUV is traveling along, and every time it hears a ping, it's calculating a bearing to the pinger. So if we intersect these bearings, theoretically, that's where the pinger is located. Um, this is called triangulation. Um, and as the AUV travels, it's um, getting more and more bearings. And so it's actually um, getting a different estimate of the pinger's location over time. So there's the opportunity to improve the estimate as the AUV travels. Um, but actually, in reality, there's going to be some error in the bearing estimate. So we should take not just the bearing, which is a line, but we should take an area around this. Um, and so instead of intersecting lines, really we should intersect these areas where the pinger could be located. And this is good actually, because um, it'll, it gives us an error ellipse. So a region where we um, think the pinger is located it's sort of a measure of our confidence in the pinger estimate, the pinger location estimate. And so finally, when this error ellipse is small enough, we consider the pinger's location to be found. Then the system is done, and its goal is just to notify people at the surface of the pinger's whereabouts. Um, so you, you might wonder, what should be the path that the AUV travels? Like, does it matter where we calculate bearings? So like when the AUV first detects a ping, where should it go next? And the answer is that, yes, it does matter a lot. Um, where the AUV travels can really affect um, how quickly it can find the pinger's location. And you might think that traveling in a straight line towards the pinger, so a straight line along that bearing that you first, you first calculate would be the fastest. Um, it is fastest if, um, if your bearings are correct and if you, um, if you don't need to locate the pinger from a distance. So this is because if you're traveling um, in the direction of the pinger, the bearings that you're calculating are all very similar. And so they don't, theoretically, they shouldn't intersect at all. So this means that you don't know very well the range to the pinger. And you basically end up having to um, travel directly to the pinger before you can find it. So it does not locate it from a distance. Um, let's consider a different path. Um, let's consider the opposite. 
Um, so the opposite to traveling directly towards the pinger is to travel tangent to it. And this is optimal for the triangulation um, because it means that the bearings are going to intersect very quickly in a small area. But at the same time, um, the AUV needs to come closer to the pinger um, to improve the SNR, so the signal to noise ratio of the pings. If you're traveling in a circle, you're staying at the same distance away. And so if you start doing this, the first time that you detect the ping, um, you'll be traveling in a very large circle and your bearing estimates might um, have a lot of error. You also risk actually traveling out of the detection range of the pinger. So this is not optimal either. But let's consider um, a combination of these two techniques. So what if you traveled towards the pinger at the same time slightly tangent to it? So over time, this creates a spiraling path. So it has, um, it has the advantage that the AV is progressively picking up pings with higher SNR. So there's more confidence in the bearings that it's calculating. Um, at the same time, it's, it's moving tangent. So um, it's a better triangulation. The bearings are intersecting in a smaller area. So this decreases the error ellipse. Um, and yeah, through our modeling, we've looked at this and um, the spiraling path is clearly a winner. And yeah, so to, to summarize the method, we have an AV with a hydrophone array. As the AV travels, it detects pings, and um, this is used to calculate a bearing at each point a ping is detected. Um, then we can triangulate using these bearings to estimate the pinger's location. And the AV adapts its path um, as it's hearing pings and as it's estimating the pinger's location um, in order to um, decrease the error ellipse as um, quickly as possible. And, and then once the error ellipse is small enough, we're done and the, ping, the pinger is located. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we've, we've modeled this um, situation. Um, we've also done a proof of concept field trial. We started out by um, taking out the AUV from the picture entirely. And so we actually just towed um, two hydrophones on an aluminum frame in a lake. And for a pinger, we have um, our IC talk projector, which is actually capable to be configured um, to sound just like the, the black box um, pinger. And so we processed the data afterwards. The signal to noise ratio turned out to be quite low. So we needed a lot of pings to, to get a very good um, position fix for the pinger. Um, yeah, as you can see, maybe you can't read it, but um, it took about 180 pings to locate the pinger to plus or minus 10 meters. Um, but that actually did not take very much time because the pinger was sending a ping once um, once a second. So all in all, it took three minutes to, to locate the pinger to plus or minus 10 meters, um, where the, our, our mock AUV started uh, more than 100 meters away. Um, we're, we're really looking forward to going ahead with this project. Um, the next step is to do field trials with an actual AUV. So starting out with some, some small portable AUV and eventually scaling this up to large and mid-sized AUVs where actually this, this method should work even better because there's a larger baseline between the hydrophones. Um, and we also dream of, of adapting the system to work with a fleet of AUVs that are cooperating um, so that Together, they're able to um, triangulate the pinger's position and, and so they cover quite large areas very quickly. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, I think we're gonna have a, a question period here shortly. 
Um, but if you don't um, get your question in on time or you have the question later, um, feel free to email either Rose or I. And I'll leave those um, email addresses up on the screen for a moment. So if anybody is interested, you can copy those down and contact either myself or Emma. And I do have, I have a few questions. Um, and I'm sure that those of you watching the presentation um, would like to ask Emma a few questions. So we're going to hop right into those now. Um, remember, if you if you have a question for Emma, just leave them on any of our social media feeds. We are monitoring them right now, and we will do our best to answer the question live for you. So uh, I guess uh, we'll start with one of my questions. Uh, I just want to know what sort of items use pingers uh, or pins? Um, yeah, so awesome? there are um, the black boxes on an airplane, for one. Um, often just any underwater equipment has like an emergency pinger in case it gets lost for whatever reason. And actually AUVs themselves often have pingers on them in case there's like a loss of communication um, for whatever reason. And so they're largely yes. used for, for recovery then? Okay, so how long does a pinger signal last? Um, does that vary? Yeah, it does vary. Yeah, surprisingly for the black box pingers, their, their batteries don't last as long as you'd think. They have to last at least 90 days. And they actually increased that from 30 days um, originally. They did that after um, the Air France flight 447 crash. Um, yeah, to give more time um, for the search. Is there a way to make a pinger last longer? Um, you would just have to improve its battery. <laughs> So um, you, you mentioned that there are quite a few uh, advantages to using uh, an autonomous system, but are there any disadvantages to using an AUV for this type of solution? Um, yes, a major one right now is that a lot of AVs are not truly autonomous. You still have to give them a pre-programmed path to follow. They can't adapt their route um, based on the environment so much. Yeah, so we're, but th that's essential to this method. So we're sort of, we're looking ahead to where AUVs are trying to go, um, which is like to full autonomy. So I have a question about um, calculating bearings. Where are um, these calculations being performed? Are they done directly inside the hydrophone? And how, how do we receive that information once they're calculated? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so this is all happening inside basically a little computer that's installed on the AUV itself. So in the computer is an automatic ping detector that um, searches through the acoustic data that's coming in. It has to also then calculate the difference in arrival times once it detects a ping. And then, um, to get the bearing, you just, you write out a couple of equations um, and that's calculated very easily. Yeah, and so then, and then also intersecting the bearings or intersecting the bearing areas that also happens on the computer on the AUV. So it, everything is underwater. Okay, so it's all largely being done at the source then? Yes. Um, so I do have a question. I, I noticed that you mentioned that you have plans to test this theory um, using these uh, small AUVs. How would you go about uh, testing this theory? What would the test design look like? Um, so yeah, we'd, uh, we'd start small with probably just sending them on a, a pre-programmed path. Um, basically, we need to figure out too, like how well the AUV um, knows its own position, um, because that's important in the algorithm. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd start small and then move up from there, in like in terms of adding complex complexity. So in one of your slides, you showed two hydrophones mounted on a single AUV. 
Um, but you also mentioned that moving forward, you'd like to see potentially uh, multiple AEVs working all together. Um, what is, if you, if there were no limitations, what would be your proposed perfect solution for this? Is it a single AUV, multiple AUVs, multiple hydrophones on a single AUV? Um, what would you like to see? Um, yeah. So I think the number of AUVs is probably going to depend on the search itself, like how big of an area it is, what AUVs are available. Um, in terms of the algorithm itself, though, um, ideally we'd have at least three hydrophones on the AUV, power and other things allowing. Um, and and the, yeah, so there's there's still some unknowns about using a fleet of AUVs, like how well can the AUVs communicate their findings with each other? Um, like how far away can they be from each other and still do that? And again, as I said, like we're not we're not experts in AUVs, but um, yeah, these are things we would sort out, you know, as we work with with people who are already using and developing AUV systems. Um, so about how far away um, from from a pinger will the hydrophone can the hydrophone be when it uh, accepts that that sound when it detects the sound? Um, so what what's the distance approximately when you would hear that first faint ping? Right. It, it depends on the pinger, like how, how loud it is. Mm -hmm. um, for the black boxes, they're, I believe, 160 dB. And like practically they found that they can locate it anywhere or they can, they can detect it anywhere from three to, um, I think, up to six kilometers away. So that's, that's, like the max, that's the maximum range that they could do. And that actually depends on the like the, the underwater conditions, and and right now they're actually they're trying to add a lower frequency pinger to the black boxes because the reason is you can detect that much further away, so up to like ten kilometers. So this might be where um, multiple AVs are are helpful in covering a, a larger distance or a greater area. Right, because like. Like our, our process where where it really helps is once you do detect a ping but you know up to that point there's still a lot of just basic searching that has to be done if right. there's a large so, area um, a pinger in the ocean is a little bit like a needle in a haystack sometimes exactly so i know that um you have plans uh coming up for a test but what are the next steps for this project? Um, can you walk us through what, what, what it looks like for you next? Um, yeah, so we, we need to start working with, with actual AVs and um, yeah, sort of refining the algorithm a bit to take into account more, um, more of like the errors that are going to happen due to signal to noise ratio, um, um, errors in the navigation system. Yeah, it needs to move a bit from the theoretical to practical world. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the results from that. Uh, and I'm sure many of the people who, who tuned in today will be looking forward to having an update from you uh, once you do some more tests and trials. Uh, but for now, it looks like those are all the questions that we have. Again, thank you so much, Emma, for joining us today. And for all of you, all of those who are watching, if you didn't get to ask a question or if there's a topic you would like to see covered during our web series, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us uh, by sending Ocean Sonics a message, or you can always drop us a line on our social media channels. If you'd like to revisit this presentation, it will be available on both YouTube and on Facebook. And I will share the link through all of the Ocean Sonics social media accounts. If you want to learn more about Emma's work with Pinger or Beacon localization, you can find an article about this project in the upcoming Journal of Ocean Technology. Thank you so much for joining us today, and hopefully we will see you on Thursday, October 1st, for a special live session um, as an introduction to uh, hydrophone arrays and multi-hydrophone deployments. We'll see you then.